This is part two of our discussion of Congress during week five. Uh, now that we have a basic structure for how Congress is shaped and functions, let's talk about some changes historically that impact where we are today. One of the concepts you have to understand is, uh, especially in the House of Representatives, and we'll talk about how the Senate differs, the way that the body functions has to do with whether power is centralized or decentralized. So understanding those terms right off the bat is very important. If you do understand those terms, the rest of the discussion will be easy. If you don't, then you're going to need to come back to this part to refresh yourself. Centralization of power means that power is in the hands of the majority party and thereby the Speaker of the House, who is the leader of the majority party. So for example, right now, the majority party in the House of Representatives is the Republicans. The Speaker of the House is Paul Ryan, who was a Republican. If power is centralized in the House, which it is pretty centralized right now, um, that means the majority party um, holds most of the power and the Speaker of the House holds most of that power. So when power is centralized, that can be good for getting certain things done, but it can also be a way to obstruct things from getting done. On the opposite side, when power is decentralized, power is dispersed to individual members and to committees. So senior people who have positions of power on committees have more power, um, rather than the Speaker of the House kind of holding all of the cards. The House of Representatives is the bigger and more democratic institution. There are more members. It represents uh, people a little more evenly in general. But the political parties that are in the House of Representatives, and we do have a two-party system, have changed the way the House works multiple times in history until we get what we have today. And that functions based on the centralization and decentralization of power. So let's look and see what has happened. In the post-reconstruction years, you have a situation where the speaker is gaining more power. The speaker would appoint committee chairs, name members to committees, punish party members who did not vote the party line, and chair the rules committee. So as we talked about in the previous lecture, the rules committee is very important in terms of what legislation gets heard and how it gets heard. If the speaker chairs the rules committee, that is a very powerful way to influence legislation, not just in terms of scheduling, but in terms of how the rules come about. In 1910, there was this revolt. Uh, it was not a full-scale revolt or revolution, but it's called Cannon's Revolt. And it's where the membership of the House of Representatives essentially said, we've had enough of this type of rule. Uh, we need more committee power, more individual members wanted power. And so they changed the rules of Congress, which can be done without uh, making new laws. It's just a rules change. And um, so it was Speaker Joe Cannon who was essentially ousted. And power was divided up amongst the committee chairs. The Speaker was removed from the Rules Committee, uh, could no longer assign committee membership roles, etc. And the committee chairs for a long time held the power. Now this becomes important because many people think of the 1950s and 60s as a time when Congress really functioned well. Um, but what people seem to fail to understand is that it was this decentralization that they're looking at where committee chairs had a lot of power. And it really depends on whether your policies were getting promoted or not. Because senior members controlled the committees, and many senior members were Democrats, uh, from the South who did not agree with civil rights legislation, a lot of civil rights legislation was not getting passed. And so in order to get that to pass and to move towards more progressive policies, the Democratic Party had reforms within its own party that shifted things. So people often say, uh, you know, so-and-so wasn't a Democrat until, well, this is when a lot of people changed. Uh, a lot of Southern Democrats became Republicans, and a lot of Northern Republicans became Democrats. And the rules changed uh, in order to give the Democratic Party a little more power to help move this along. 
So there was a little more of a realignment and a little more of a centralization, but not full-on centralization. That changed in 1994. Uh, many of you may have heard the name Newt Gingrich before, and Newt Gingrich uh, orchestrated this contract with America, which was a way to get Republican leaders uh, elected in 1994 to the House and to the Senate. Uh, it was the first time in many decades that they had held both chambers of Congress. Uh, and the Republicans, once they were elected, promised to do certain things like reform welfare, uh, and, and things of that nature. And to do that, they changed the rules within Congress to get that done. Uh, essentially, they ended the seniority system for committee appointments. Everything was done on whether you were in good standing with the Republican Party or not. The Speaker had a lot of power again, and the Speaker was Newt Gingrich. Uh, they drafted legislation, submitted it. Uh, committees were kind of a rubber stamp for a while. They used a lot of special rules uh, to limit debates on bills. And uh, this worked to get certain things passed, but it also really aggravated a lot of Democrats, especially those who had been there for a long time. And so in 2006, when the Democrats took back the House, they promised to make changes to some of this. Uh, but you'll notice the question mark there. They said we're going to you know, essentially decentralize power. Uh, and they did to some extent, but they didn't do it at first. They waited until they got their 90-day plan in, which included things like uh, raising um, the minimum wage, extending unemployment benefits, uh, and then they decentralized power to a, to a smaller extent, but they still uh, didn't decentralize it completely. And that's kind of where we stand today. Even though the Democrats no longer hold the House of Representatives, the rules are pretty much the same in that the party holds a lot of control and the speaker holds a lot of control. And so when we compare that with other time periods, we need to realize that we're not always looking at the same Congress and that that can lead to different interpretations of the same thing. The Senate's a little bit different though. Generally speaking, the Senate is a little more stately collegial and there's more room for uh, bipartisanship. So members of the Democrat, Democratic Party working with the members of the Republican Party and vice versa. It has become a little bit more like the House uh, in recent years, but there is uh, there are some norms that exist, uh, and especially existed pre-1970s, that don't exist in the House. And so these are important things to note because Madison once said, the Senate is kind of like the saucer that cools the tea. So if you've ever had a cup of tea on a fancy saucer, uh, you might pour a little bit out in order for the tea in the cup to cool down. Well, the Senate moves slowly, but it's collegial. And so the, Madison's idea was that you had these norms that worked in the Senate. They might not work in the House, but they kind of stand in the way of anything rash happening, which, if you remember Federalist 10, was a problem Madison thought could likely occur. So these norms included apprenticeship, so junior senators would study under senior senators and defer to seniority, legislative work in that uh, certain senators were master crafters of legislation, especially in one area where they would specialize, and so specialization was a key thing. Uh, Joe Biden, when he was in the Senate, had a couple of areas of specialization, including foreign affairs and violence against women. Uh, courtesy and reciprocity. When senators disagreed on issues, they did so without personal attacks. And this really opened it up to being able to trade favors as a mode of cooperation. And then finally, and this is still true to some extent, institutional patriotism. Senators take a lot of pride in being senators and being the upper chamber rather than representatives and the lower chamber. It's a little bit of a highbrow thing, but it also gets people to act a little more collegial to one another. In the 1970s, the same reforms that happened uh, in the House with the Democratic Party did change uh, the Senate a little bit. And this included the fact that the senators had more paid staff and they were assigned to more committees than just one, which means they can't specialize quite as much as they used to. And we have the growth of the filibuster. The filibuster is a way in which the minority party can stop something from happening in the Senate. As long as you have uh, 41 votes 
you can keep debate going on something, even though the majority wants to shut it down. This was recently reformed, so it can't happen with judicial appointments anymore, but it can still happen in other normal day-to-day -day matters. And the filibuster has grown exponentially in use over time, and it's kind of the norm now. So filibusters, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, it's an old movie with Jimmy Stewart, but that's what he was doing was a filibuster. They used to be pretty rare. Uh, they're not as rare anymore. Uh, and most of the time, the threat of a filibuster is enough to get people to change how they would behave. So here's the thing. We hate Congress. Uh, the only time Congress had a real spike of approval was right after 9-11, and it went down pretty quickly thereafter. On a good day, Congress is really lucky these days to have 20% approval rating. As of January, they had 16. That's pretty normal. The president has 46. That's not high. But it, you can see how a president who has a lot of people who don't like him uh, still ranks 30% higher than Congress. But what's interesting about this is if you break down congressional approval and disapproval, because if you know um, your representative, your opinion changes. If you were to ask someone if they approve or disapprove of Congress, most likely they're going to say disapprove. But if you were to ask someone if they approve or disapprove of the way their representative is handling his or her job, they're more likely to approve. So these are just a smattering of numbers, but you can see it's about 46% or anywhere up to 66 or 64% that approve. Now here's another uh, add-on to that. If you are able to name your representative, so in Flint that would be Representative Kildee, if you're able to say, yes, I know Kildee, uh, you are that much more likely to approve of the job that person is doing. So it goes up about 20 percentage points there. So what's behind this? Well, there are certain things that our representatives do that make us like our own representatives but hate Congress. One is constituency service. Our representatives do things for individuals and businesses within their districts that gain them favor. They uh, help provide references. They help navigate the Social Security system or the passport system. Uh, they have people in their offices that do nothing but constituency work. So that's one thing. They also spend in the district. They spend on visible projects within their districts that make it easier for us to like them and still hate Congress. And they play off of that, so they run for Congress by running against it. Every politician, this is not just Congress, but every politician vows to go to D.C. and clean it up. Even politicians who have been there for decades. Uh, few actually do clean it up, but they run on that message. Here's an important note. Despite the fact that some of this sounds like window dressing, they actually are pretty responsive to what the people in their district want. Most representatives actually do vote the way the people in their districts want to do. You can track this, and many political scientists have. So the thing is, is that they'll take positions in their districts favor, even if they're not nationally popular, but this may lead to disjointed national policies. Uh, a few other things, they take advantage of media coverage in the district, so that's free PR. Uh, their name recognition alone goes a long way psychologically. And this kind of goes along with that responsiveness to the electorate. We have a system where districts are significantly uh, altered in order to shape the voters that are in that district. Uh, one interesting thing that people from other countries don't really understand why we do it this way, and uh, maybe you don't either, is that it really is the representatives picking who they represent, not the people picking who represent them. And what I mean by that is every 10 years we have a census, and after every 10 years in that census we have redistricting, and we'll talk about that process a little more in future lectures, but these districts can be gerrymandered or created in such a way that preserves the power of one party over another 
uh, in order to create safe districts. And these safe districts don't incentivize people to work together. So we have a lot of policies in this country because we have a lot of districts that are safe and people don't have to find the middle political ground. So, talking about middle political ground, uh, Barber this week is our, uh, Benjamin Barber is our supplemental reading. And Benjamin Barber is important because he does believe in this idea of a republic. But he thinks our republic, uh, our country, is not a good example of that. So the first thing he does is he lists the six ingredients that he thinks are necessary for uh, a republic. And these are six ingredients that it's not just him making them up. These are things that people who have theorized about republican values over the years have found to be true. So things like small-scale society, so you have a small population and small territory. Social and cultural homogeneity, so you have people that act alike and think alike and believe mostly the same things. Economic self-sufficiency and relative autarky. Uh, what that means is that people are generally self-sufficient in terms of the economy itself, not in terms of individuals, but that you don't have to rely on other countries. Frugality in lifestyle and austerity regarding materialistic things. Uh, so frugality in lifestyle, not spending on a lot of frivolous things, not trying to be ostentatious, just buying what you need to get by. Rough economic and political equality of citizens. Uh, and distrust of rapid change. And he says America has none of those. The U.S. has none of those. Uh, one of the things that people might disagree with is dis distrust of rapid change, but I think generally speaking, he may have a point there. Uh, so he says these are necessary because classical literature points them out, but also because they provide a strong sense of commonality and community and a clear public identity. And that without this, you can't have a spirit of self-government. We can't all agree on what government should be. So the American dilemma for Barber is that we've never had any of these agreements. So the founders had to be creative to make a republic work. So they changed the ideology that upheld Republican virtue and instead incorporated new things. So if you think back to Federalists 10 and 51, they talked about manifest destiny and having a big country being a good thing, even though that's not classic Republicanism. Uh, and so we've replaced this idea of being self-sufficient with being innovative or being uh, having a good business atmosphere. And we've replaced things like being small with quite the opposite, kind of this big manifest destiny idea that we would be a country that goes from sea to shining sea. And we also, so we changed the ideology, that's step one. Step two is that we created these unique institutions. And these unique institutions are Congress and the presidency. So we'll talk about the aspects of the presidency that are related to Barber uh, next week, but with regard to Congress, what he says is that this bridges the gap between uh, participatory self-government. So in a small republic, we would all kind of have to go to what essentially was the Iowa caucuses and get together and talk about issues and vote on them. But that having a representative do that kind of makes it easier to govern large groups of people uh, with different interests. And that it can also act as a way to calm down on things. So these factions can't take hold because you have a representative who can kind of mediate these factions, theoretically, if the representative is up to the task. Um, the problem with this, he says, though, is that not all representatives are up to the task, and many of them fall prey to some of the same passions. So Barber is not optimistic about uh, the large-scale republic. And when we talk about the presidency, we'll talk about this other part of the coin, which is Congress isn't just a unique reaction to not having these things, but the presidency is as well.